Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Wall. Well, today we're going to look into a topic of plant-based eating. It's a huge trend that's becoming a shift in the way that we eat. More than 40% of Canadians are incorporating more plant-based foods in their diets. And there are around 2.3 million vegetarians and about 850,000 vegans in Canada. And as we'll learn today, introducing more plant-based choices into your diet can offer many health benefits, including helping to prevent and manage chronic diseases and even providing performance enhancing effects for various types of exercise. Now I've seen a vast array of information on the topic in popular media, so I wanted to get the right info from the experts in the field. I also wanted to hear from someone who's a friend about their experience about becoming vegan. So we have a lot to cover today in our episode. Well, joining me first is Dr. Hannah Kaliova. She's an MD and PhD and part of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. She's an author and a researcher into this very topic. She joined me from her office in Washington, D.C. to share more. Let's check it out. Hi, Dr. Kaliova. Welcome to the show. Hi, Mike. Thanks for having me. I'm really glad you could join us today. You are a researcher, uh, but maybe you could tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and what you do and where you teach and where you research. Absolutely. Uh, I'm an endocrinologist by training, and since medical school, uh, my passion is uh, nutrition research. I'm helping people to optimize their diet in, in whatever chronic condition they have. So we do randomized clinical trials for people with diabetes, for people who struggle with being overweight, who have cardiovascular disease, and uh, so many other problems. Uh, and we just optimize their diet and see uh, what it can do for them. And it's truly amazing. It's a, it's a fascinating journey to be, to be there when the people go through these changes and I can be uh, there with them. And I work at the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine in Washington, D.C. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization that provides nutrition, education, and research. Mm -hmm. And I head up the clinical research department. That's perfect. Well, you're a person after my own heart. My PhD was in endocrinology and uh, obesity derived hormones and diet. So I can't wait to pick your brain today because when I was looking through the research, I was really trying to find what's the highest quality research I could find that talked about the value of plant based diets. And so let's start off with the overall definition. How would you describe plant based eating? A plant-based diet is a diet that's based on eating fruits and vegetables and whole grains and legumes. That would be the power plate. And as you can notice, all these plant foods are super rich in fiber. Uh, and so it would be a diet that's packed with fiber and antioxidants to maximize the health that comes as a, as a direct result. Are people starting to migrate away from eating less meat these days? And, and like, if so... What's the rationale for people doing that? Uh, you know, there's many, many diets out there. There's keto diets and paleo diets and so many other diets. And sometimes it's just hard for people to really orient themselves in, in all of these diets. And sometimes they're like, oh, uh, you know, I heard on radio that a keto diet is good for, you, for your weight loss. So let me give it a try without even digging into it, you know, without getting all the information they need. And so it's also about people kind of experimenting with different diets that are out there. So it changes constantly, uh, but throughout the time and even during the pandemic, the consumption of plant-based foods has increased. So we see a clear shift in people looking for more tofu, more plant-based meat alternatives, more fruits and vegetables. Uh, so we definitely see a shift toward plant-based eating. I can agree with that. I mean, even subconsciously over the last number of years, I think my red meat intake has decreased dramatically. I've had more fish and more chickens. And that just, I don't know if that's a function of just being exposed to different education or just, you know, the way it makes me feel. But how does adding more plant-based choices into our diet impact our health? It's super powerful. Not many people realize how much fiber can do for you. <laughs> and it's not only the fiber, it's also the antioxidants. Uh, it's other, there's several hundred of phytochemicals in, in plants. So whenever eat, when, whenever we eat plant foods, 
uh, it just does miracles in her bodies. So if you struggle with a high cholesterol, your, your cholesterol will come, come down. Uh, your blood pressure will improve. Um, you will feel better and will notice that your sleep is better. You will have more energy. Your skin will improve. There's just so many aspects of health that can improve. If you suffer from pain and inflammation, your inflammation and pain may go down. Uh, you're doing a plant-based diet is the best diet against diabetes, against cardiovascular disease, and against all the chronic conditions uh, that people usually suffer with. That's right. I mean, people don't realize that fruits and veggies have so much more than just nutrients like carbohydrates. They've got their micronutrients and fibers. And, uh, you know, I was, I heard one time in Canada, we've got lots of snow so that uh, fiber was like a snowplow going through our digestive system that helped clear things out of the way. <laughs> I like that analogy. Yeah. It's like a cleaning crew. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's perfect. So, okay. So when we get into, you know, plant-based eating, there's people that are eating more vegetables that still maintain eating meat. Then there's people that are vegetarian. Then there's people that are vegan. Can you explain some of these categories? Because I think it's really confusing for a lot of people. Uh, absolutely. Uh, so uh, a vegan is a person who doesn't eat any animal products, no meat, no dairy, no cheese, no eggs. So it's only fruits and vegetables, whole grains and legumes and some, some nuts and seeds. That's it. Uh, then there's uh, lacto-ovo-vegetarians who um, don't eat meat, but still include some dairy and do include some eggs in their diet. Then there's semi-vegetarians who include some, some fish and maybe some, some white meat. Uh, then there's flexitarians who are, you know, who eat plant-based diets most of the time, but occasionally uh, they have some animal products. Um, you know, when, when there's, for example, eating out with friends, they may break the diet and have some, uh, you know, a little, a little dairy or uh, even even meat on occasions. Right uh, so there's a whole spectrum, uh, and uh, the and now the question may be, which one of these is the best, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so obviously, uh, it's an individual choice, whichever diet you will choose. Uh, however, one compelling argument comes from the Adventist Health Study too. Uh, where they looked at compared semi-vegetarians with lacto-vegetarians and vegans and compared them to non-vegetarians. And they were looking at their body mass index. And they found out that the more animal products people were eating, the higher their body mass index was and the higher the risk of developing type 2 diabetes as well. Mm -hmm. And the the group that was the the best off was vegans <laughs> they were the 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 group that was the slimmest and had the lowest risk of developing type 2 diabetes mm -hmm. uh, so it looks like there's a clear linear relationship between animal product consumption and uh, your overall health because it's not only about the pounds or kilograms on your scale mm -hmm. uh, it's also about your cardiometabolic health that comes with uh, with your body weight whether it's a healthy weight or whether you're overweight and need yeah. to lose some extra pounds yeah, we had, a, we had an episode recently on obesity, and we were talking about the difference between weight. Somebody has a tiny waist and big shoulders, they might weigh the same as somebody with big waist and tiny shoulders, but that weight distribution is much mm -hmm. different. One's muscle, one's fat. Um, you know, so those are a lot of health benefits. We're going to go a little bit deeper into those, but are there any negative impacts or conditions which somebody might not want to adopt a plant-based diet? First, first of all, it comes to me, I'm thinking about like uh, iron deficiency comes to mind. Uh, yeah, some people are kind of concerned about these deficiencies. Uh, you just need to look into the causes and um, somehow solve the issue uh, rather than, you know, discard a certain diet because of your fear of any deficiencies. Uh, one vitamin that I would like to stress, which needs to be supplemented on a vegan diet is vitamin B12. Uh, it's a it's a vitamin uh, 
that decreases as we age uh, because the absorption uh, is lowered. So as we age, it's, it's a good idea to supplement vitamin B12 anyway. Mm -hmm. In the past, people used to get vitamin B12 uh, from soil bacteria because the sanitation level was not so great as nowadays. Uh, so you, they got a little bit of dirt with their vegetables and with their fruit. Uh, and also they were getting um, the bacteria from, from the stream when they were drinking water. Uh, the drinking water also contained uh, just a little bit of bacteria that were good for you, that were producing vitamin B12. Uh, but that's not true anymore with with the civilization and the level of sanitation nowadays. Uh, we just uh, cannot rely on these sources of vitamin B12. So it's a good idea to supplement it. The supplements are cheap. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a water-soluble vitamin, so you cannot really overdose yourself. Uh, so a small, uh, you only need a small amount, like 50 micrograms a day. Uh, so uh, that's one vitamin that I would highly recommend to supplement. Mm -hmm. And another one is vitamin D, especially over the winter months mm -hmm. uh, when you're not getting enough sunshine. Yeah, yeah. Especially, but that's a, gener that's yeah. a general recommendation regardless of your diet. We're chatting with Dr. Hannah Kaliova, MD, PhD, and part of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. She's telling us all about the benefits of plant-based eating. We'll be right back after the break. Welcome back. We're chatting with Dr. Hannah Kaliova. She's an MD and PhD and part of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. She's sharing all about the benefits of plant-based diets. Let's get back to the interview. Some of the conditions that people might contemplate doing this, obviously there's a cosmetic side of things and there's an overall health and fitness side. There's a lot of people that could really benefit from a medical standpoint. Who are some people that you would encourage from your medical side of things to look at this type of nutrition? Uh, all people with chronic conditions, people with diabetes, uh, people who need to lose some extra weight, people with cardiovascular disease, with cancer, with autoimmune conditions, such as type one diabetes or rheumatoid arthritis or other autoimmune conditions, people who are struggling with chronic inflammation and pain. Um, yeah, there's, there's many conditions where a plant-based diet can be very useful. Mm -hmm. And I'm guessing that like uh, a plant-based diet would also emphasize reducing things like processed foods and, and some of those more junk foods that we see a lot of. Uh, is that the case in the research you've seen? Uh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. We encourage pe people to use as many fruits and vegetables and whole, whole grains and legumes um, and, uh, you know, stay, stay clear from all the ultra processed foods. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then when people are avoiding that, they're eating better, they're eating more natural foods. What about the timing and frequency of meals? Does that impact how they respond to this type of nutrition? Absolutely. That's another important aspect of nutrition. Uh, so once you change the diet composition uh, and you're still not getting the results that you wanted, um, meal timing and frequency is another topic. So there is a lot of research that shows shows that eating breakfast is protective against weight gain, even though people who regularly eat breakfast may eat, consume even mo more calories than those who skip breakfast. But breakfast jumpstarts your metabolism. People who eat breakfast also have a, a higher energy expenditure throughout the day. Uh, so it's important to eat breakfast. And on the other hand, skipping dinner may be equally beneficial. Mm -hmm. uh, people tend to have these reversed and they tend to either skip or have a super small breakfast and then gorge out on, on dinner. Mm -hmm. But if you can flip these, if you can have a large breakfast and then a very light dinner or even skip dinner sometimes or, or even on a regular basis, that's even better for you. Mm -hmm. It'll improve your metabolism it's been shown that two meals a day are actually better than three meals a day uh, in terms of waist circumference and in terms of body weight. Mm -hmm. So if you're struggling with some extra weight, 
uh, skipping dinner uh, would be, you know, one of the easiest recipes. Yeah, it's so funny. There's so many things that come into play. There's that intermittent fasting idea behind that. But I mean, the essentially for anybody listening, the, the formula is calories in and calories out. And if you want to consume calories, put them in when you're going to expend calories for the whole day. But don't put in a ton right before we go to sleep and we're about to lay down and not use them because your body doesn't want to get rid of them. It stores them. And so, you know, really basic stuff. But again, makes a lot of sense. And I would assume that if we're eating a plant based diet and we're having more filling natural foods, that would also help with satiety as well. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, especially breakfast is, is key for satiety. Uh, it's been shown that people who regularly eat a big breakfast are less hungry throughout the day, and they also make better choices with their food throughout the day. Right. Okay, excellent. That's good. Well, we all need to make better choices sometimes. So if you were to give any advice to our listeners that were looking at this, what resources should they go to to find out some more information to get the right info about plant-based eating? Uh, so I'd recommend going to our website, pcrm.org. That's for, for Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. So pcrm.org. And you can find out plenty of recipes. You can also find out studies for, for different conditions. For example, you type in hypertension or rheumatoid arthritis. And it, you know, it'll give you plenty of research on how diet can improve all, all these conditions. Mm -hmm. We also have a free 21-day vegan kickstart. So that's an app that you can download to give you some recipe ideas. It's, it's fun. So go to our website and check it out. That's excellent. That's excellent. So I would be remiss if I didn't ask you that outside of just nutrition, what other advice do you have to people to maintain a healthy lifestyle and basically complement changes that are positive in the way they eat? Uh, yeah, that's an excellent question. Uh, you know, we, I find out uh, that whenever I'm more physically active, uh, my diet automatically adjusts and tends to be more healthy. Uh, so if you can uh, incorporate it in your daily routine to start your day with some form of exercise, which can be pretty simple. It can be just a short walk. Uh, it can be a run. It can be a short workout. If you can incorporate uh, physical activity on a daily basis, uh, that will help you with your cravings and it, it will improve your overall diet quality. That's fantastic. Well, it's so great to get advice from you. Is there anything you'd like to leave our listeners with before we clue up today? I'm super excited about everyone uh, who's listening about, I really wanted to say, I'm really proud of all of you about, I'm, I'm proud of all of your progress. I know it's hard. Sometimes you're up against the stream. Sometimes you're up against yourself and your habits and you're listening to this podcast and you want to do some, to make some change. Uh, so I, I'm really proud of you that you're putting all this work. And I'd like to tell you, don't give up, <laughs> keep it up. Uh, and I'm, I'm currently working on a book that's called um, Two Meals a Day, Keep Your Doctor Away. <laughs> and that book will cover the topics of plant-based eating and intermittent fasting. So stay tuned, keep up the good work. And even if you make one small change today, uh, just keep it up because it will pay off in the long term. Well, you have just guaranteed yourself to come back on because intermittent fasting is something I want to talk about. I want to talk about your book when you get further along or you're ready to share those results with people. Dr. Kalova, thank you so much for taking the time to share your expertise that everybody listened today. I know I benefited. I know everybody listening did. So thank you again. Thank you so much, Mike. Well, that was Dr. Hannah Kaliova, MD and PhD from the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. When we come back, we'll talk with Pierre Forbet. He's the Acting Director of Sustainable Protein Production for the National Research Council. He'll share how industry and agriculture are embracing the increase in plant-based nutrition and what it means for our economy here in Canada. Stick around, because we'll be right back after the break. 
Over the next 10 years, plant-based protein is expected to contribute more than $4.5 billion to Canada's GDP growth from primary sources like pulses, soybeans, canola, and hemp. As the world's largest producer and exporter of dry peas and lentils, Canada already counts on plant-based proteins for its economic activity. Now, Canadians aren't alone in seeking plant-based proteins for themselves and their animals' diets. Global demand is surging, and meeting demand requires that challenges be overcome. So I reached out to Pierre Forbet, who's the Program Director for Sustainable Protein Production at the National Research Council, to learn more about how Canada is embracing the shift in nutrition. Let's check it out. Hi, Pierre. Welcome to the show. Hi, thanks, uh, Mike. And glad that you guys invited me. Happy to be here. Well, I couldn't help it. I, I, I was stumbled upon the work that your group has been doing at the National Research Council. So for our listeners, can you give them a bit of background on yourself and what the NRC does? Uh, sure, I'd be very happy to do so. So my background is that I'm a molecular biologist and a crop geneticist. I've been with NRC for 28 years. And my research has been primarily focused on improving disease resistance and seed quality in some of the major Canadian crops that would include wheat, canola, and peas. Uh, for the last two years, I've been in leading a program at NRC that's called the Sustainable Plant Protein Production Program. Um, so we commissioned a market report, and that's what we'll be discussing a little bit more today. We commissioned this report from an organization that's called Agri-Food Innovation Council. And we wanted to do a, a report into the plant-based protein area to provide us with some overview of the sector, including you know, trends and challenges on, on, on different things. And this helped us in developing our program. Yeah, it's some interesting insights. That's where I stumbled upon it uh, because it was publicly available, which is great. But you know, maybe you could give our listeners an idea of what's the size and the scope of the plant-based protein market here in Canada? So in Canada, the plant-based market is worth somewhere in the area of like one and a half billion dollars, or at least it was in 2017. And it's expected to continue to grow and grow quite rapidly and, you know, contribute more than four and a half billion dollars to our gross domestic uh, product. So it's quite large. I, I think maybe to provide a little bit of context as well as, you know, whenever we're talking about plant-based protein, so most plant sources contain some amount of protein. It's an essential nutrient in it for our diet, and, and it's, it's present quite ubiquitously. The plant-based protein market tends to focus more on those sources that are high in protein. Mm -hmm. So here we can talk about pulses. So pulses are the dry seeds of, of legume crops. So we were talking about our peas, lentils, chickpeas, uh, things along those lines. There's other seeds that are rich in protein, so canola being one of them, and whole grains and nuts. So these things together are really what we talk about whenever we're talking about high sources of plant-based protein. Mm -hmm. Well, those aren't insignificant numbers when you're talking in the billions of dollars, and obviously agriculture is a huge part of our Canadian economy. What's driving the demand for these new types of proteins, or not really new, but emerging trends in protein? Yeah, you're right. It's um, you no, know, it, it's certainly growing really fast, and mm -hmm. there's a few different drivers for this growth. I, I think a, a very important one is the rapid global population growth. Mm -hmm. So we have many, many more people on the planets, and these people need to be fed, and they will require protein, whether animal protein or plant-based protein. I think also there's this awareness of the health benefits to switching over to protein-rich plant-based foods. For example, Plant-based diets have been associated with lower risks of type 2 diabetes and cor coronary heart diseases. And there's evidence to suggest that even incorporating one or two meals of plant-based protein and replacing it for, for, from animal meat on a weekly basis has health benefits. And then I think the third reason that we're seeing this growth is there are more and more consumers that are placing a priority on the environment. And uh, production of plant-based protein compared to farm livestock is much less impactful on the environment. And so I think that those three things combined together is really what we're looking at that's driving this, this, this growth. And you know, in Canada alone, there's more than 40% of the population have said that they are actively trying to incorporate more plant-based protein or more plant-based food into their diets. 
Because I always wonder, like when I see these new burgers and different products being developed now, you mentioned pulse crops and some of the things, but what are the, what are the main ingredients that we're going to find in the uh, in these products outside of what you mentioned? Yeah. So I think in terms of ingredients right now, the largest source of ingredients on the plant-based side is soybean. Mm -hmm. So that represents about 80% 80 of the market. Oats and peas are projected to grow the most, you know, as consumers are really looking to as alternatives for soy. You know, so I, I think soy was the early comer on the market and there's been a lot of innovation with soy, but there's also some negative impact and negative perception of soy, you know, which in, includes the fact that um, a lot of the soy products come from genetically modified organisms and uh, as well as there are some allergens associated with, with, with soy. So people want alternatives, especially you know, people that are, are, are you know, vegan and that sort of um, are really concerned about the environment. So the common ingredients that we see are, you know, can be classified as, as flowers, concentrates, and isolates. And then with these, with these you know, flowers, concentrates, and isolates, the kinds of food applications that they tend to go into right now, um, in addition to, you know, like your Beyond Burgers that you just mentioned, <laughs> I think, you know, they, they often go into soups, spreads, snacks, some breakfast items. We also see them used in sauces and dressing. So often they're used as thickeners or they're used to stabilize some of those, those foods. They're also used as protein enrichment for pasta and for breads. So very often you'll you'll have some plant-based protein in there. Pulses in particular seem to be very well suited for this. So what are some of the challenges and the opportunities that the plant ingredient industry faces in Canada? That's an excellent question. You know, um, the industry, it, it's a new industry, right? I mean, so there's uh, significant opportunities right now and significant challenges as well. Some of the key challenges have to do with the flavor or the aftertaste associated with some of the plant-based you no know, product. So again, people that have eaten soy-based be, soy products sometimes talk about a beanie flavor. Mm -hmm. you know? so, so we're, again, we're trying to do some fundamental research in terms of understanding you know, what accounts for this beanie flavor, how can we control it either through the breeding side of the house or through the fractionation side of the house uh, to come up with better products. I think the other one, which is related some ways to those, that, that taste, is anti-palatability and anti-nutritional factors. So they can affect the digestibility and the absor absorption of the nutrients. And again, we don't want this because you, you definitely want you know, full benefit of, of being able to make use of the nutrients that are in there. Uh, solubility is another um, challenge that, that exists right now. And I think overall, there's the, you know, the economics of it as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to try and get that competitive price point to be able to do some of this, to develop some of these products and still be competitive so that people will want to buy these products. Mm -hmm. Well, we think about the protein industry right now. It's absolutely massive. It's been around for an awful long time. It's like electric vehicles competing with, you know, gas engines. Uh, you know, there's a lot more infrastructure in place for one than the other. Um, but that that's it is interesting that they would have challenges like that. But I can tell you one thing. I think that uh, plant based proteins have come a long way in a very short period of time when you think about some of the alternatives that now exist. I, I agree. It's it's a you know it's very dynamic, very fast moving uh, industry. You know we're seeing a lot of entrepreneurs and and even the you know the the big players, the multinationals. I think in a lot of ways have to you know readjust their business models. They have to sort mm -hmm. of really be able to respond to to the demand. And you know maybe a lot more boutique, a lot more specialty products as opposed to what we're used to seeing in in the past. And I you know I think this is a general trend, you know, sort of focused on the consumer. So you know, what the consumer has the buying power. The consumer, um, you know, has a limited amount of money that they want to sort of use to to get the products that they want. And and mm -hmm. with again changing demographics and changing way that, that business is done on a global mm -hmm. stage these days. Um, yeah, I mean it's it's moving quite quite rapidly. And health literacy of the consumer as well. I mean, it's driving the whole product. Now, we're about to close up here, but you know, you were on the front lines of being able to look at the information as it came in and see what the emerging trends are in the plant-based protein market. What are your overall thoughts and final comments for us? 
the, the growth in plant-based protein you know, represents a real significant opportunity for Canada. And uh, in particular, to be able to shine on the global stage. I mentioned already that we've got this, the, the strength on the production of the crops. And as we sort of bring this complementary and additional sort of capabilities to produce at a large scale, the ingredients, and to sort of then make the products, the consumer products, the, the, the potential really is, is quite, signif quite significant. Mm -hmm. And we've already seen a fair amount of investment in this area. Um, at the same time, you know, it's an early stage and innovation is going to be critical to success um, in order to be able to continue to sort of overcome some of these barriers that we have, because culturally we're entrenched in, <laughs> at least in Canada, in terms of meat eaters. You know, so so there's 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 certainly the science, there's the social aspect of this as well. So as Canada's largest federal uh, research and development organization, you know, NRC is well poised to help Canada capitalize on this on this opportunity. You know, not only would it be great for the companies that are innovating when it comes to farming and our economy, but also if there's health benefits, this is good for everybody that's engaging and just even buying these products. So that's why we did the show today. Pierre, thank you so much for taking the time today to join us and to share your insights from your project. Thank you. It was, it was a pleasure. I, I learned a lot from you as well during, the, <laughs> during this brief interview. That was Pierre Forbet, Acting Director for the Sustainable Protein Production at the National Research Council. When we come back, we'll chat with my friend Jason Callahan, who chose a vegan lifestyle nine years ago. He'll share what his experience was like and clarify some common misconceptions. We'll be right back after the break. Welcome back. We're here with my friend Jason Callahan, who chose a vegan lifestyle almost nine years ago. He joined me to share about his experience and clarify some of the common misconceptions in becoming vegan. Let's check it out. Hey, Jason, how you doing? Hey, Mike, how's it going, man? Good, man. You know what? We've known each other for a long time, actually, probably close to 15 years, I'd say. We, we worked together in the offshore and recently we reconnected. I, I didn't know that you had become vegan, but I thought it'd be really interesting to hear your perspective on it because... I knew you were always active and fit and, and into healthy lifestyle, but you know, how long have you been vegan for? Uh, I've actually been vegan for just about nine years now. My yeah. wife and I uh, made the switch about, uh, yeah, just uh, it'll be nine years in a few months now. So yeah. And we're still alive. So imagine that. Yeah, we're good. I, I know. And I, and I think there's a lot of misconceptions around it, which is the point of today's episode is to clarify things that you could be very healthy and, and be very fulfilled in the way you eat by choosing a plant-based diet, you know, what, what motivated you guys to make that change? What motivated us? So I guess uh, we were living in Houston at the time. We were quite involved with dog rescues. Actually at the time we were, uh, we got more and more into rescuing. And, and as we got more involved, we, we saw more of the facts about, you know, the terrible ways that animals are exploited just to get at certain tastes in your mouth. And, that was hard to deal with because, I mean, like a lot of other people, I had just accepted eating meat and dairy growing up as the norm to be healthy. I probably didn't want to dig into it anymore. I didn't want to probably afraid of knowing the truth. Right. So just accepted it, never looked at it anymore. But once we started seeing these things more and more, we started to understand what happens to these animals. There was no real way to rationalize or justify keeping eating meat and dairy and that. So. Mm. I felt strong about the animal side. And then I decided to do a lot of research on living that vegan lifestyle for my own well-being. Will I, you know, will I see a, a drop in my energy, my strength, my focus? Will I get sick easier? Will I get skinny? All these things that people worry about, like myself at the time. And I usually research quite a bit before jumping into anything, especially something like this. So the more research I did, the more I understood that there were also way more benefits for me as as an individual, when I followed a vegan lifestyle, it was basically a no brainer after I did a bunch of research and I was pretty open to it. You know, I wanted to do it. So there was all the misconceptions, I guess. And I, I just dug more and more into it. And, you know, nine years later, I still couldn't agree more, to be honest. I mean, we've got uh, my wife, Megan and I, we've got three kids under 10. We've got three dogs. I've got a busy job, seven to five. And then we've got our own small business that takes up a lot of nights and weekends. And mm -hmm. as you know, involves a lot of lifting and that. So 
we might get a, a good four hours of broken sleep a night thanks to uh, the dogs mm-hmm. and the kids and that. And uh, I, I, to be honest, I mean, it's still good to go every day. And mm-hmm. maybe back then I, uh, I subconsciously created a massive nine-year experiment from hell just to truly <laughs> test the vegan lifestyle. So we are. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, obviously, if anybody who would know you, you, you work out all the time, you're extremely fit. Um, and so you didn't have to worry about any of those negative repercussions when it came to your fitness level. I had a question though. Is it, is it yep. tough to be vegan? Like what challenges did you guys experience, especially at first when you were trying to migrate away from a diet that had meat? Yeah. So is it tough to be a vegan? It's, I mean, when, like I said, I did a lot of research and when you do the research, like the real research, the evidence based facts that you see all the benefits to your own health, to the environment, to the animals, it's hard not to be a vegan. And, and I know that sounds a bit of a cliche, but it's true. Like you have, you've got the long-term health benefits like heart disease, cancer, diabetes. And I'm sure you've talked to others about all of that. You, you, you're you quite in the loop on that. Uh, you got the day-to-day health benefits. You feel better. You got more energy. You got, you're basically increasing those good levels in your body and, and decreasing the bad. So that's just automatically going to impact how you feel day-to-day. And I can I can honestly attest to that. <clears throat> you got the environmental benefits, you know, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, deforestation issues, and the animal side. And, and you know, people get very upset, upset when they hear about the dog meat markets overseas, but mm. yet have no issues grabbing a steak that follows the exact same process for a, mm. a cow or a lamb. And that. So the only difference is our perception. And we're conditioned to think we, we need to eat meat and dairy like like myself growing up to be healthy. And that's not really the case at all. So it was, mm. I guess it was easy to justify going vegan. And and the hard part when I first started was wondering if I could keep it going. It made mm-hmm. sense, but could, how long will this last before I'm like, okay, this is not going to work. Once I made the switch, it it was a lot easier than I, than I anticipated. I had, like I said, I had that more energy. I felt better both physically and mentally. And I just had that good feeling of, of doing something to help. And mm. yeah, you know, there was, there was definitely learning curves. There was a lot of trial and errors, you know, but that made a lot of fun. I was open to the change. You got to be open to it. You can't go in with that negative thought, right? I mean, yeah. I tried different things. Some things I liked, some things I didn't like. And it's no different than trying anything new. Besides finding a lot of new meals that were awesome, I also realized that I could just pretty well make most of the same meals I always loved and just leave the meat out, whether you use a, be- a meat substitute or you're using beans or something instead, or you're just sticking to the vegetables and, and other items and not having meat in, or it was just as good, if not better, you, you know, you could taste the other ingredients if, instead of just tasting that meat flavor. Right. Right. Um, and I guess for the challenges when we first started, uh, I'd say the main challenge I faced was the, the bad vegan jokes. Uh, they were terrible. Like, there was like two or three main anti-vegan jokes and you, <laughs> You'll get used to hearing those over and over again. And so if you can get through that, you'll be okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. But probably the bit, the biggest challenge was, was we figured out what to eat and what not to eat and what mm-hmm. we liked and didn't like. But when we were out on the go on the road, finding places to eat restaurants or fast food joints, that was probably the hardest thing at the time, nine years ago. And mm-hmm. that's certainly not an issue anymore. I mean, most fast food joints have vegan options and there's, obviously almost all restaurants have a good selection of vegan choices for you. So that's right. That's yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. That, that's a, uh, that's an important question for people is access to food. And I guess the yeah. other question that goes hand in hand with access to food is the cost. Is it expensive to eat? Oh yeah. The, the, uh, the, the almighty dollar. Um, yeah. It's, you know, as well as I do, it's, it's expensive to eat, especially here uh, in general these days, whatever your diet may be. Right. I mean, you're, we're, we're seeing that rise, even the, the drive back and forth to the supermarket is a lot more costly these days. Um, but from, from, from saying, and saying that there are like anything, there's ranges of food options, depending on your budget. I mean, you can, you can go to the nth degree and have everything super organic and, and you're going to spend for it. Right. But there are definitely lots of uh, choices to eat great vegan meals, save money, feel great. Um, like I usually make a lot of my meals in bulk and, and freeze those, whether it's chili or curry, pasta, stir fry, anything like that. And then the cost is definitely lower. You're using, you're using basic ingredients that taste great and, and it goes a long way. Right. And for a vegan diet, you're honestly, you're, you're using most of the same foods and ingredients that everyone uses for a healthy diet. So it's, I, I definitely don't see it being more expensive than just any healthy, healthy diet for anyone. Right. Mm-hmm. 
Okay, a question for you then on, on that too as well. Do you take any supplements to account for some nutrients that you may or may not be getting with the diet you used to have? Uh, yeah, I mean, well, I guess most people hear of the B12 deficiency, right? So, so I take that daily. Um, and obviously, there still are a number of products, vegan products that, that have B12 in them or are fortified with B12, like plant-based meats and soy and almond milk and things like that. So, so I definitely take B12. Uh, D3 is another one, but if you're living on the tropical island in Newfoundland, I'd suggest taking <laughs> vitamin D for everybody. Yeah. Um, besides that, I, I take multivitamins just like I did before going vegan. And I mean, to be honest, whatever your diet is, there's a good chance you're not getting everything you should have on a regular basis. And yeah. that's why we have supplements and vitamins to begin with. Right. So, yeah, yeah. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, okay. So I think a lot of people besides the vegan jokes, the other thing that's a, ma a major conception for people would be that it gets super boring. You have to have the same foods all the time. Does it have to be boring? Are there alternatives? Like how do you get around that and be creative? No, it's a good, good question. I mean, any diet can be boring if you don't try different things. Before I was vegan, I used to choke down cans of tuna and boiled chicken every day because it was healthy and good for working out and weightlifting, right? And that was boring. And I got sick of it real quick. I just felt I had to do it, right? Mm. So now I eat a bunch of different foods that are delicious, meals that I've I've never said is boring or bland. And, and you, I mean, if you go into anything with negativity saying this is going to be boring or I can't, I can't eat what I'm used to eating, you're going to find that negativity. You're going to say, you know what? This isn't working. I, I told myself it wouldn't work and just give up. Right. So that goes for everything you do. Um, a good advice would be, you know, accept that it will be different. It's not bad different. It's just it's just different. It, it like if you have plant based meat instead of real meat, they, they, they're not going to taste identical. Yeah. And that's OK. Or if you're having a stir fry and you use, I don't know, uh, spicy tempa instead of chicken, it's not meant to taste like chicken. It's just meant to be another taste. That's good. Um, so we're not we're not inventing new food and new ingredients here. We're just switching up the recipes a bit. Yeah. There's a lot, there's a big list that you can choose from still. You're certainly not limited at all. And you can basically make it as boring or as amazing as you want to be. It's not really the food options. It's the, it's the chef here, right? That's, uh, <laughs> yeah. that's going to make it boring or not. So. Yeah. It's nice to hear from somebody who's gone through the experience. What you're saying exactly mirrors the information that we received earlier from Dr. Kovlova. So uh, I, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing that with us. So hopefully other people can hear that it's very attainable to do. It's not super easy, but it's also a lot easier than people think. It is. It's uh, again, like many things, that anticipation is by far the worst feeling like, oh, this is going to, this is going to be hard. I'm going to fail all that. But just, you know, get the facts and uh, be open to the changes, good changes. Um, and there's always going to be that propaganda available for what, what you want to believe, what your mind wants <laughs> to tell you to believe, right? In every aspect of life. So yes, it is. Yeah. You're going to exactly. hear different things and, and just be open to uh, be open to the truth and, yeah. and, and, and give it a try, right? There's lots of, lots of websites, Google it. You'll find hundreds of recipes, just simple. You don't need all the, you don't need all the different cookbooks and that. I mean, some of them are great, but uh, just Google some options, try a few things out, see what you think. Uh, there's a couple of great documentaries out there as well, as you might know, the Game Changers, What the Health, Fork Over Knives, uh, many other ones. Those ones are great for, for just getting a good understanding of, of what, it, what it is to, to have that vegan lifestyle and have that plant-based diet in your life, right? So, All right. Well, that's awesome. Thanks so much for joining me today, man. No, thank you, Michael. It was a pleasure. I appreciate the time. Well, thank you to my guests for joining me today. I honestly didn't know too much about plant-based eating before the show, so I definitely learned a lot. I hope this is some food for thought as you look at how you can change or improve your own nutrition. I know I'll be making a few changes for the better as a result of today's guest's information, especially when I think about the health benefits, the environmental impact, and of course, animals. Well, that's our show this week. We'll see you back here next week for another episode of The Wall Show on your... VOCM.